All right, I am super excited to nature journal some pumpkins with you today. And we're going to talk about what pumpkins are, a little bit, a little bit of history and botany about pumpkins. But we're also going to look inside of them and look on the outside of them, practice some nature journaling techniques with pumpkins because you might have some lying around. They're also, speaking of lying around, there could be some items hiding on the table that you may notice and identify or perhaps not. Um, and I just wanted to introduce myself here. This is, of course, the Nature Journal show, but today we have a special host, the original Nature Journaler, Leonardo da Vinci, visiting from um, the 1500s and here for the day. So really grateful to be here with all of you. Hopefully I can contribute some uh, Leonardo-esque ideas to the nature journaling practice today. And speaking of Leonardo's time, Leonardo lived in the time period shortly after Columbus um, traveled to North America and began an intensive um, trade connection between those continents. And one of the things that um, did come from the New World, um, one of the major crops among many were um, pumpkins. And this is a whole genus, Cucurbita. There's a variety of other um, fruit in this genus. Um, and sometimes there's multiple species that are actually called pumpkins. So we'll talk about that um, soon. And let's switch back here to the handy dandy um, document camera and start looking at some of these things. Um, let me get this tarantula out of here. Um, and this little snake. Okay, so this is the foliage. Um, so this is obviously a lot that we can nature journal here. Um, this is actually the foliage of um, one of the cucurbita species that produces this fruit, um, which are called chilacayotes. It's cucurbita fetidifolia or something like that. And then this is um, sort of your standard pumpkin. Um, I didn't even have to carve it. It already came with a funny face on it. And um, this one is Cucurbita pepo, so the same genus. And I, th uh, I think this is Cucurbita pepo too. And then there's a couple other um, Cucurbita species that contain pumpkins as well as some of the squashes. So let's get our nature journals ready and get ready to dive right into it. And there's a couple, I'll point out as we're nature journaling them, a couple of the main characteristics with this genus that you can, that will help uh, you identify them. And I bet Ivea covered cucurbita in one of the um, uh, plant families in your food classes that she did. So um, go ahead and share that link if you have, if you can, Ivea, I bet you covered cucurbita because one of the important food ones. Okay, cool. So now that I got this set up, I've got my chocolate, I've got some mate, and I've got some cool plants in front of me. This is going to be great. So where I often like to start, I mean, obviously I should put some metadata, so I'll do that quickly. Um, should I start on this page? Yeah, why not? I'll do it. Okay, so metadata. We might have to change the name of this because I guess Facebook changed its name to meta, um, which kind of ruins that prefix, which I used to enjoy um, that prefix so much. So there's a chance we might have to change the name of what um, we call this in our nature journals. But I'm just going to write uh, nature journal show. I like to have something in my data here, my entry about um, like what kind of nature journaling I'm doing. So if, for example, I'm nature journaling at home, doing nature journaling homework, that might be a good thing to write. So I'm just gonna do that. Cause otherwise I might think um, when I look back on this or someone else looks back on it, I might think, oh, did I nature journal that while I was at someone's garden? Um, and so also saying that it was during the Nature Journal show uh, live and the date, spooky date of the year. And I, um, 
I did a patron only Halloween party the other night and Beth Ann was there, which was really great. And she mentioned that in Australia, Halloween is not um, practiced there. Um, is not like a important th event there. And I know a lot of places in the world it isn't. One interesting thing about Halloween to point out is it's one of these um, e events or holidays that falls on or close to an astronomically important day of the year, which is we're basically halfway between the equinox when the days are the same length um, and the solstice when the um, sun reaches as far north or as far south as it's going to in its um, transit, its arc across the, uh, the sky. And so um, that's an important event. So Halloween is not just a totally random thing. There's a lineage of like recognition that that time of year is important. Okay, so that means the days are getting shorter and shorter and the nights are getting longer, but we're halfway to the longest night in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so I'm going to um, just show the weather, even though I'm inside. It is drizzly. And then I'm going to do an inside outside temperature guess. So I'm guessing it's like um, 50 outside. and it's 68 inside and i think uh i might be missing something one o'clock p.m but that's probably good for metadata for um, a little homework session let's get that to there we go i can see that oh now everything else is dark great Okay, cool. So I'm going to start with a uh, leaf shape and just do some quick sketches. And I notice I wonder it reminds me of to get me sort of warmed up here. So I'm going to look at this leaf right here and just kind of do a quick, uh, whoa, warm up sketch here. So you can see I was very focused on the outline. And while doing that, focusing so much on the outline, I messed up the proportions. And so of those two proportions are actually more important. So what I should have done is more like um, looking at it and kind of what basic sort of shape is this? Is it like a pentagon? And then also noticing the relative proportions. And then I could always, and even if I got that, that's better than this. Um, even though this has some more accurate aspects of the edge, this has the a more accurate kind of overall perspective. Wow, the tendrils like grabbing onto my wig. Um, these tendrils are really good at grabbing onto things. So uh, I want to nature journal that in a second. That part's really cool, by the way. Feel free to, um, if you're kind of going faster than I am because I'm spending more mental energy talking, um, that's fine. Try to apply, I notice I wonder, to any of the other objects that you see here on the table that you could be um, nature journaling while I am doing my piece here. Okay, so then the leaf comes back in um, here and it opens up wider and then it goes that way again on the way out. Okay, so I'd call that fine. Um, if I want to, I could just keep going with those a little bit, but I think what I'm gonna do is try to show um, maybe, let's see, a simplified part of the stem. So one way to simplify this, um, this genus of plants is to draw sort of a diagram of it from the side um, and showing the flowers and the tendrils. So I'm gonna do something sort of like that I'm holding it at an angle so that it looks uh, good on the camera, mostly. It's not super good. So I see the tendril coming down. And remember, this can be as diagrammatic um, as you want it to be, or it can be more of like a portrait. And if you've seen some of Akshay's nature journaling, for example, he's developed some really cool ways of um, simplifying and focusing on the elements that he wants to show the most and creating these diagrams that make it really easy to see the important information. 
So now I see this tendril part going down and I'm not going to get caught up drawing the curly cues. I'm just going to make these sort of simplified versions of them. And then I see that the leaf comes from below and goes up and then there's a flower tucked in here, but I'm going to move the flower. So sometimes you can do that. I think that actually, no, I shouldn't move the flower. It looks like that's a consistent characteristic of this plant. There's certain things it's okay to take artistic license with, but there's certain things that are really important characteristics. And if, if you're not a botanist, you don't always know what those are, or even if you are a botanist, maybe you don't. But um, I think that uh, knowing a couple of the things, for example, on birds too, once you learn a little bit about birds, then you're like, okay, I can't just fake how many um, feathers they have here on the, um, the end of the wing. That's actually an important factor. Um, it's this, it's the same with certain aspects of plants. So I was just about to fake that this flower was coming out behind the leaf because that would have worked easier for my drawing. But then I looked and noticed that they're all doing that. So that seems like something I probably shouldn't fake. If they were like alternating and going back and forth, then I would feel more okay with it. So what I could do here, I have the choice to, I've drawn a small flower here um, and I'm gonna, I have the choice here to like make an exaggerated one. Um, there's a couple ways I could indicate that that's not, those aren't contiguous on the plant, but um, I just want to do this as a diagram. So I'm going to um, first mark this uh, or have sort of a blowout box here with a title. And this right here, all of these are male flowers. So um, these ones, when they're sm really small, it's a little bit harder to tell that they're male flowers, but you can see it has this long stem right here that's lifting it up away from the main vine. And as they mature, you can see they get longer and longer. So look at how long that stem is now. That's just a slightly more matured male flower. And then here's one that's gonna, whoa, the um, plant touched the light and changed the temperature of the light. There we go. So you can see here, this is one that's gonna open tomorrow. And uh, you can see that it is a lot bigger, but it still has this long stalk. And you can just see the sepals right here. There's not like a large swollen organ there. Um, so those are all male flowers. So what I'm gonna do, and then, oh, this is one that opened yesterday. So it already opened and then closed. Um, since there are no female flowers around, it probably didn't really do anything except maybe feed some bugs. Um, you can also eat these ones. They're really tasty raw, but you can also cook them. And you're not really sacrificing. If you're growing in your garden, you're not sacrificing any fruit. So I'm going to set that one there because I'm going to add that next to my diagram. Okay, so what I said I would do is I'm going to make a consistent system for, for naming these. I probably should have put a little bit more thought into that part, um, the different stages of the flower. Maybe there's a way to like circle it or highlight it. But for this one, I'm going to show that slightly more mature one. Leonardo da Vinci would probably just be drawing these curly Q things. He was really interested in curling and spiraling things. Spirals were one of his big obsessions in nature. So he would probably be focusing on these and then also maybe like measuring how the size changes um, and seeing if there's any mathematical pattern to that. I'll spare you that for, for right now. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw this one in here. So relative to the ones I was drawing, I think it's gonna be huge. So maybe I can't completely make it accurate to scale. Draw some of these hairs coming off. Okay. This number of sepals is important too. It looks like it only has four on this one. It's kind of surprising. 
And now I have to, now I'm going to have to draw it on top of this funky leaf up here, which is kind of annoying. That's the kind of thing that used to drive me absolutely crazy. But um, I think I'm trying to get better at just like, oh no, I have to draw over another, you know, there's a little bit of another drawing here. I can just draw over it. When I was a kid, I would totally freak out about that. Um, even up until pretty recently. Still, it's not my ideal, but that's one of the things we can learn from Leonardo also is that he would just fill his pages and didn't waste paper because paper was way more expensive. Um, and uh, so he would fill his uh, pages with drawings and he would also not worry if he's like overlapping some other thing. Um, so I think it's actually a good practice even if paper is not as expensive as it used to be to just um, see if you can be okay, like drawing over other drawings. Like what do you have to do to make it stand out? Maybe this was a bad idea, but I'm just going to put some like black down here where the leaf is to make this flower stand out a little bit more. So yeah, that's one thing that uh, maybe you're already like good at, but it's definitely something that's, I've struggled with, so I'm trying to get better at just like squeezing more drawings into the page and not worrying if there's like multiple topics or subjects. And if I have to draw over something else, I'll do it. Oh, that's so cool that Akshay is gonna be teaching for Melinda's group. That's awesome. Yes, I will take a flower um, picture and send it. Um, even though I don't think it's going to open now that I um, picked it, but there's, there's more of it growing out there. Okay. So um, this is sort of, maybe I'll just put numbers here for these stages. And I'm going to do a thing, make a symbol here showing that this is not um, contiguous. Uh, how does that symbol usually work? Sort of like a lightning bolt. Um, so like if you see a diagram and there's like a cord or a pipe um, and it's like a hundred foot long pipe, they're not going to waste all of the paper drawing that pipe. What they're going to do is they're going to put a symbol here showing uh, something like this. And then the pipe continues, but they cut out like a hundred feet of paper of straight pipe. So what I could do here is I could say um, approximately, oh, I should make two of these. I think that's the way to do it. Approximately, um, how many inches did I eliminate? Over 12, 12 oh, the, the plant's touching the light and changing it again. Okay, so um, I would say it's 18 inches, approximately 18 inches from that flower to that flower. Okay, so that's how much I eliminated. Now I'm going to use some words here. Oh, I'm noticing that some of these other ones have five of the um, five of the sepals on them, actually. I think that's what they're supposed to have. One, two, three, four, five. Ooh, and that one just broke off. So perfect one to hold up close to the camera if you want to see that more up close. Remember, you can always pause the video if you're watching it. If you're watching it live, then um, you still can pause the video, but I think you'll just kind of um, fall behind unless someone was watching them at like tw double speed so they could catch up to the live or something like that. Anyways, um, you could always pause and draw this um, this flower close up while I'm holding it here. So that is the small male flower. That's not an example of an I notice because it's small, sure. No, maybe even small wouldn't count, but everything here is not something I'm noticing. This is information I'm bringing in or interpretations. Um, so if I were to do I notice, I would say um, I would pay attention to something that's a direct observation. So I notice it smell it 
it has a strong smell. Small hairs, small pale hairs. And it has five part symmetry. The other thing I could do is just draw it from a different angle, like it straight on. And it looks like the it's a pentagon and the sepals are coming out in the flat places. Whoa, and it has a little bit of a spin to it. See how it has a little bit of a spin to it? Uh, is it, I guess it's spinning counterclockwise. Oops, something like that. Okay, cool. Yes, Karen, the vine is possessed. It's really funny because I have a, um, just I'll show you here really quickly. The lamp that I use for filming these videos, it has like a touch screen. Um, and so it, it works as a touch screen, but for whatever reason, this plant, when the leaves touch the buttons, the, the leaves of the plant actually uh, activate it, which is kind of surprising. Oops. Okay. All right. So I got the small one. I've got the, the medium one. I don't think I'm going to do this. You could spend all day just drawing this because look at how beautiful that is. And you can see it the way it's origami up. I, I love it, you know, and this is all going to, it's, it looks like it has a little bit of that spiral too. Doesn't really look that regular. And um, it's just really, really going to be cool. I wish I could do a time lapse of this. You could probably find plenty of them online, but time lapse of a pumpkin, some sort of pumpkin or cucurbita um, uh, flower opening up. Um, okay, so that reminds me, I haven't put a title in here for cucurbita yet. Oops. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and make a little bit of a title, and I think I'll just squeeze it in here. I usually do like doing sort of bigger titles, but that's fine. And it is. Um, a binomial name, so it needs to be italics. Cucurbita. And it's capitalized because it's the genus. So the genus is always capitalized and the species is lowercase. And since I have several species, I think you can just put lowercase s, and maybe this doesn't need to be italics. SPP means multiple species, I think. Okay. So, which is useful, that's useful to be able to convey that much information in, in those words. That's why scientists came up with that system. Obviously, it has its downsides, but... Okay, so now I got that, um, and oh, I should probably put this... I, I don't remember off the top of my head the species name of this one, so I'm not going to write that down quite yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do sort of a more involved... Um, drawing of this flower right here and I'm going to put it here so that hopefully you can see it pretty well there we go and I'm going to drink a little bit more mate but what I what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze in oh I'm going to put a bubble around this I'm going to squeeze in sort of the flower, like a zoomed in version of this flower um, right here on the page. Maybe I'll even make sort of a light frame for where it's going to go. And then there will be more text down here. Sometimes it's good to, I used to do this with my Tombow pins, like um, kind of plan out where things are going to go. This helps with your composition. You can do it after the fact sometimes, but it's sort of my major element here. Is that Tombow pin even showing up on the screen? And then maybe the text should go this way. No, the text shouldn't go that way. The text should go across this way if I do any text.
That looks like a pretty good composition. Nice, that's awesome, Ivea. Yeah, Cucurbitacea is my favorite herbaceous plant family. I mean, check it out, look at this. I'm gonna show this book a little bit more in a minute, but look at all of these amazing species in the Cucurbitaceae family. Look, you've got um, wax gourds, watermelons, West Indian gherkins, musk melons, cantaloupes, jelly melons, cucumbers, um, Malabar gourd, that's the one we're looking at, Chila Coyote, Fica Folia. Um, you have squashes, Hubbard squashes, um, you have pumpkins, you have gourds, you have loofahs, bitter melons, chayote, you have casa banana, you have serpent gourd, Armenian cucumbers, and did they not mention, um, oh yeah, all of the melons, watermelons, and everything like that? That is pretty crazy for one family. So um, definitely a really cool family with lots of uses too. So this one's Ficafolia. For some reason, I thought it was Fetidafolia because it smells kind of fetid. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to try to get my, my kind of overall proportions right this time. And the important thing to notice on this flower is down here, there is no ovary down here. And in a minute, we're going to look at one little baby one that does. Um, but this has no ovary and it has a long stem. So if you're going to do a portrait of this flower, it's cool if you just kind of do. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. But if you know a little bit about botany, you have to remind yourself, okay, what is the important information that I need to show here that is characteristic? And one of them would be, at least for telling if it's a male or female flower is the length of the stem and the lack of a bulge um, at the top of the stem where the ovary would be. And then these sepals coming down are also important in terms of their number. Even on this one, it's an anomalous or one broke off and it has four. So this part up here is hard because it's sort of disorganized. It's definitely not as easy as like a, as this. This is like Apollo and this is Dionysus. And there's like less organization up here, which can be hard. Um, sometimes using a drawing tool that you have less control over or using watercolor um, can help um, kind of simulate that. Or if you practice lots of like drapery and drawing folds and stuff like Leonardo did than you would or some other sort of classically trained artists even today study that then you would totally be able to crush this drawing um, really easily. I have not however. So I'll just do my best and maybe I can use color to help me um, capture what I couldn't capture in the volumetric uh, drawing. Remember, sometimes you can use color as sort of a shortcut to convey something like this. So how much drawing do you need to do if you can just make a blotch this color? Like how much information can that color communicate and how fast can you get that onto a page of paper? I talk a lot about like how you can do something more efficiently or quickly as almost as if that has just like an inherent um, benefit to it. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but um, I'm particularly interested in being able to do things quickly and efficiently because I want to be able to capture ideas and observations as quickly as I can. And a lot of times in the field, there's a lot to see and drawing and writing um, are much slower than our visual processing or, or our mental processing. So I think that um, being able to do them quickly um, is, is really beneficial, especially for the type of nature journaling in the field, like real nature journaling. Okay, I, at a certain point, I need to just stop adding details because it's not getting any better. It's only getting worse. I tried putting in some dark darks, but maybe they're not that helpful. Uh, maybe I'll do a little bit down here because these are pretty strong shapes. This is These dark darks are something that I'm trying to get better at. Um, Mark Simmons obviously is great at them. Oh, there's a hole. It looks like there's a chewed 
couple chewed holes, I think. Mm, can't tell for sure. Uh, the next thing to do would be to dissect it um, and cut the flower open and look inside of it. So I'm just going to let that dry. Um, and then maybe I'll put a little title here, uh, larger male flower. Um, or mature, I should, maybe it's mature. Um, already opened. Male flower. And I'll put long stem. And no ovary. All right, cool. So let's just um, dissect this flower here. Ooh, I should have done that closer to the mic because it made a really cool sound. I'm going to start doing flower dissection ASMR videos on YouTube. It'll probably be a bigger audience than nature journaling. Ooh, so I cut a little bit into that base, that column. I'm not sure what that would be called there. Um, see how it's splitting open? Oh, see, that's, that's bad. I want to see what that looks like there, actually. It's dripping liquid onto my paper. So I'm actually, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull off the whole Corolla, just the fused petals here, and look right at that. So it looks like the base here has one, two, three, three things that all come together. And I'll just make a little arrow coming out this way. And show how there's like these multiple things coming together. It looks like it still has quite a bit of pollen on it. Pond's wet though. It'd be really cool to look at this under the microscope. Um, so that's that. I'm just going to write that um, I removed. So I have an arrow going from the full flower to the um, taken apart one. And what I'm going to do is write um, the first. The first word that came to my mind was disrobed. So I'll just go with it. Disrobed. Um, and okay, so that's it for the male flower. Uh, we should definitely look at the female flower um, before moving on to another another cucurbita species or cutting into one of these fruit because I think we should look at seeds too. And I think the next place um, to check out before going to seeds would be the fruit. So you can see here, um, it's just these long stems, male, male, and they always they always start, these cucurbita plants always start off creating lots of male flowers before they get to any female flowers. So you can see this one's probably made one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's already made not, it's made like 10 or more male flowers before it makes a female flower. Um, in general, in nature, males are cheaper than females females, I think almost like 100% of the time. So that that um, has a lot of impacts on things in the world. Um, so just thinking about that, because creating, um, like if you look, where'd that thing go? Okay, so it's like making those little pollen grains, they're really little, they're pretty cheap. But when we cut into one of these fruit right here, we'll see that the female version, the seeds are 
a lot more um, expensive. So the plant doesn't want to make them unless it knows I'm, I'm personifying the plant. The plants don't, it, it's, it's expensive for a plant to make fruit and seeds if they're not going to succeed. And so um, pollen, however, is very cheap. So making lots of pollen to guarantee fertilization is, is a good bet. So there's a lot of ma male flowers have already been flowering for a while, potentially attracting pollinators to that area before the plant even makes a female flower. So immediately you'll notice that even though it's small, just like this one, it has a different shape. And this one has a slightly longer stem. This one is um, slightly closer. And look at how big that part is underneath the sepals. So compared to this one, look at that one. Obvious difference, right? So that is the female flower. It hasn't even started to turn colors or open up yet, but there's already the possibility of a fruit um, in that ovary and that can turn, that would turn into this. This one's like been in my house for like three years. These fruits stay good forever. Um, and this is what they look like um, before they're fertilized. So I'm gonna do a quick drawing of that. You could be noticing other things while you're nature journaling at home. For example, that maybe you'll notice some of the leaves are wilting or maybe you pause the video and zoom in on some other aspect of this plant that you're intrigued by. I'm going to draw this female and I'm gonna make it uh, life size. And then I'm gonna do a blown up version. Okay, so next to this one I'm gonna write actual size and then I'm going to eat some chocolate because it's about time okay do I really want to zoom in on this I don't know if I need to zoom in on this because um I don't have it's not that big of a thing to look at, so there's not really that much more detail I can add to it. All I'm gonna do is uh, make a female sign next to it. Oh, that reminds me. I had one, two for these stages of male flowers. I should put a three corresponding three down here next to this one. Maybe I won't put a male over here because then I have to put a male next to. Oh yeah, I'll just put a male next, a male symbol next to all of these actually. Um, to the left. Look how much visual hierarchy I can get just with the Fude de Monin. It's really cool. And really easy. All right, see how the visual hierarchy is working? Things kind of have a nice, um, nice look. Perfect and imperfect flowers. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out, Ivea. Dioecious and monoecious are really good terms to know. Okay, so um, I said I was gonna write a bunch of stuff here. This is one of the downsides of creating sort of this composition in advance of your nature journaling because you might get to this point and you're like, I don't really wanna write or like, I wanna draw the fruit now. Am I gonna squeeze, am, am I gonna squeeze this into this area down here? I think that would be really hard. So um, I'm not gonna do that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll preserve that and I'll skip to the next page. All right, so vote in the comments if you want to nature, which of the fruit you want a nature journal. Do you want a nature journal, the regular old cucurbita pepo Halloween pumpkin variety? 
that probably doesn't even taste good or anything. Do you want a nature journal? Also, cucurbita pepo. This is the delicata squash. Do you want to cut into this one and nature journal that? All right, bye, Gene. Have fun walking your dog. Or do you want to nature journal the chila coyote, which is just the um, fully grown fruit of the one that we were looking at um, already? Vote in the comments which one you think we should do. If you've never used them before, if you go to the side there, you can find the comments on YouTube and on Facebook and post something. All right, I'm not seeing any votes yet. Go ahead and post in the comments what you, which one you want to do. All right, no one is voting, so I think I'm just gonna go. Oh, the one with the uh, okay. So Eve has no preference, and Karen is the one with the most interesting insides. Okay, all right, great. Sounds like a plan. So I think I'm gonna change the camera angle hopefully this camera works okay because i think this will be better this is a brand new camera angle that i've never experimented with before but i think it'll be good for cutting cutting something open All right, I think we should, let's just cut this one. Let's cut this one open since it's the species that we've been looking at. Um, well, the only thing is if I cut it open, then this one's been like sitting in my house for like two years. So I kind of want to see how long it will stay good for. Let's just cut open the delicata squash. Um, okay, this these are interesting on the inside for sure. And I should probably get this giant pumpkin out of the way. The giant pumpkin. Okay. So um, let's first just do a sketch of what it looks like, I would say, on the outside. Um, at least the bait, sort of the basic shape of it. So draw it from the perspective that you have. That should be, I think that's a pretty good perspective that you have, actually. And you could draw uh, the knife also. Sometimes I like to do that. It shows that you're what you're up to. Or I'll show like a hand cutting it in half to indicate that it's been cross-sectioned. So I figured this was like the closest thing we could do to cutting open a cadaver like Leonardo da Vinci would really be doing. I thought this would be slightly more, um, you know, uh, mainstream and you could still eat your breakfast while you're watching it. Sometimes I watch YouTube videos while I'm eating breakfast and some of them sometimes it's just like, okay, maybe I don't wanna watch a tarantula feeding video um, while I'm eating breakfast. That might be a little bit. So um, botany videos are usually better. <laughs> okay, so I don't wanna get too into it and I can come back and do color all at once because there was some color that I wanted to add on the other side, remember? And you can't really see, with this particular angle, you can't see my drawing, but there it is. Um, okay, so let's uh, start cutting this thing open. And which direction do you think would be the most interesting to cut it in? We could try several, but sometimes it's fun to try to imagine like what will have the most useful information. Um, the stem is also really important. I didn't. I forgot to talk about this before, but the characteristics of the stem are really important for identifying these two species. So the stem is really hard. It's brown and it has five noticeable one, two, three. Four. It has like six sides. It seems like it has six sides to it, flat sides. Hard, brown, six flat sides.
versus notice how different the stem is on this one, even though these are actually the same spe same species, supposedly. I'll leave this one like that in case you want to draw the stem. Kind of cool. All right, so I'm going to just do the sort of cross section, like the radial cross section, which it might be cool because this sort of has like a radial symmetry. Um, if I cut it this way, I wouldn't notice that. So since that's an interesting pattern and we might be able to cut it in several places and look at the difference, um, I'm going to do that. And one thing you can do is you can show on your drawing where you're going to cut it. So for example, I could use a dotted line right here. And then I'll come up with my next dotted line when I do it. I don't want to commit in advance because we don't know what we're going to learn when we first cut this part here. Oh, one thing I'm noticing right away, I don't know if that's a wax layer that they applied at the store, but there is a, um, as soon as the knife goes in, there's this texture change happening um, on the skin, um, which is like, uh, looks like a wax layer is breaking away. Good thing this knife is really sharp. So I'm really glad we use the radial. See the, nothing is set up for this camera angle. So the light's a little bit weird. It looks like a guava on the inside, but I'm really glad that we use the radial angle because it's very interesting to look at from the side. And I am noticing this, what looks like wax on my fingers. Maybe I'll prepare my cuts in advance and then just nature journal. Uh, sometimes having a sidebar for distracting bits of information is useful. So over here I can just put down um, waxy layer question mark. Looks like guava. Sometimes just have, oh, and there's little beads of, of juice forming juicy sap way more on that side than on this side that's an interesting observation okay now i'm going to do another cut and then i'm going to switch back to the other camera um so this time i'm going to do um, i'm going to do one more cut this way and then i'm going to do a cut that way Okay, this is good because we're going to get to see seeds. So that's pretty much right in the middle. I'll draw my dotted line going through the middle. And then I'm going to cut it lengthwise too. switch back to the document camera here I want to get this thing that I can just switch I just push one button and I can switch cameras because right now it's it's hard to switch cameras okay so let's nature journal these different perspectives now oh my goodness is that what I think it is Yep, check this out. There are seeds germinating inside of the fruit here. See that little sprout? That white thing is a sprout. Okay, so we've got, these are our perspectives right now. I'm gonna set them up at angles so that you can see them best. It's gonna be a little bit different than what I see, but I think that'll make it better. So this one is the, the very tip piece. Um, it's, it's not even balancing straight up and down because it has the, the stem on the other side. Maybe I can, here we go. So there's that one. I don't want to zoom in too much because I want you to get to see all of the, the objects here. There's that one. And then there is, um, let's show, I think showing this side would be best. Okay, so then that is, um, I'll put letters on these. So this one is A. Oops, no, this is A. And um, this one is B.
And then this one will be C. All right, cool. This is totally like something Leonardo would do, but with a person. Uh, I don't think these ones are going to be very good. Uh, Karen's asking if you planted these, would they grow? I think it's this one, for example, is broken. But I think that a lot of times, like with squash, if it's sprouting inside of the fruit, I don't usually, I wouldn't personally choose those seeds to try to start. And then it's also the fact that it's the wrong time of year in the Northern Hemisphere for these. Um, this ficofolia one actually can grow through the winter where I live and survive some frosts, but not this one, I don't think. All right, I would choose from some of these other seeds to plant. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do A, B, and C and show them. So let's do that um, over here. A. Sort of like just a thin layer, even of skin that I notice at all. And then darker layer in the middle and I don't really notice that much geometry to it. So I'm not gonna make it up. And I'm gonna redo the outline a little bit to get the sort of angular, almost scalloped pattern on the outside. Noticing these marks actually come pointing in more. So there we go. And there's not really any seeds yet either. Okay, so now B, I'm gonna try to draw it relative in size. Um, and the fluting is more noticeable, so I'm gonna try to count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I think that's like 11, so that's too many. How How is there, there's gotta be a more simple um, way to, simple shape to turn it into, maybe like more of like a hexagon. So I'll start with like a circle and then flatten the circle out. Okay, so that's sort of my basic circle and then it, it looks to me like it's more angular this way and this way. I don't want to overdo this fluting, but it definitely has some. Okay, and then in here, it almost looks like a square. I could be measuring these um, distances a little bit again. dark spot here. There's this, I, th I think this is called, um, what is it called? The tissue around the seeds? I forget. All right, so I got some of the darks, lights and darks. Well, what Eva is pointing out that they don't come true. The seeds won't come true from a squash either. So um, that is a whole nother thing. But yeah, but I wouldn't, just in terms of like, the, even if this plant had been carefully had the flowers uh, hand pollinated, I still would not try to grow these ones that have already sprouted because they're um, probably not going to be good. But in terms of the genetics, if this plant was grown in a place that had other cucurbita pepo being grown, um, such as this, this one, then they could cross pollinate. It's very likely that they will cross pollinate um, through bees moving the pollen from one male to the other one's female. Um, then they will genetically be a weird mixture and it's sort of unpredictable in that first generation what they'll come out like. So that's why home gardeners say that you can't save seed from squash and pumpkins um, and other cucurbits because they um, are outbreeders. Um, 
and they won't be true if there's another one of of a different variety growing somewhere within like a couple miles i think all right so now i'm going to um draw this one which is uh c oh and then i should say um oh i'm gonna do a couple quick measurements here So the side wall on this one is 1.5 centimeters. And then the side wall on this one, interestingly, oh, it's about the same, but it's narrower in some places. It's more variable. So I'm gonna say, from one to two centimeters. Um, Sidewall varies. One to two centimeters. Okay, now I'm gonna say something about the sprouting. Oh, where to go? I took it out and, oh, there it is. I'll put it up here would be a perfect place to put it. It even has a little teeny bit of green up there. So right here, you could put down some notes. Oh, Valerie's here. Hi, Valerie. Oh, Eva, yes, it's probably, that would probably be the best term for, I was thinking of there's like another term that it is sort of more of like a, uh, not like a botanical term. It's like, I want to say placental, but, or embry, embry, something about embryo. I can't remember. Um, okay, so there's a sprouted seed. And then um, we can look at one seed individually and draw bigger. But first, I'm going to do this one, which is um, our section C um, that we cut. So I think I can fit it in here. I'm going to try. Whoops. That's probably not, probably needed to be bigger than that. Oh, shoot. And this is probably the coolest one to draw. And I kind of squeeze into the corner here. Your proportions start to get worse when you get close to the edge of the paper. And they've done some like studies on this that I probably made this. Notice how like this one looks like it's wider and this one kind of got squished just because I was getting close to it. And it could be just my hand coming off the edge of the paper, but we often squish things as we get close to the edge of the paper and our proportions start getting messed up. So be aware of that tendency. That's a natural tendency. There's definitely some uh, seeds in here that are not uh, not good, not viable. You can see like this, this really little looking one here. It's very lightweight and clear. It's like a bubble of air. I just popped it. That's not a viable seed. This one probably isn't either. Notice how flat that one is. I'll bite into it. And see it's hollow on the inside. This seed, however, see how it's puffed up and round on both sides. <clears throat> and you can't tell this, but there's a weight to it. There's also this rim around 
the outer edge. When I bit into it, it had this whole thing on the inside that I'm eating right now, which is kind of good. So there is the meat in there. So that tells me that that one was viable. All right, I'm not going to get caught up with all this like weird um, stringy stuff, but I'm just going to try to get a little bit of the pattern in here without over patterning it and show the way this kind of comes up here in the middle. This is also a thing that if I were just going straight to watercolor, I could probably capture this faster. And I'm just going to count the visible seeds. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 visible seeds. I'll put an approximate sign. 18 visible seeds. So one thing I'm noticing that I, I would probably come back in Nature Journal again, and I bet Leonardo would be really into it, is look at how like all of these seeds right here I need a poker. Look how all of these seeds right here are sort of connected to this one long tendril. So like, I wonder if these tendrils are, as the fruit matures, if these tendrils are sort of like the umbilical cord attaching to the seeds, um, if there is anything like that, or if not, um, how do they kind of, where are their, you know, nutrients coming from that turn into the seed? I also wonder if these are, um, how much genetic difference there is between each one of these seeds um, and how, how does that work? Um, I wonder which part of the seed um, is attached to the plant. It kind of looks like it's this tip part here. This one looks like it's still sort of attached. These are all the kinds of questions that I could be asking. Oh, look, these are all facing forward. Um, that's really interesting. Oh, wow, that is a really interesting. Very interesting squirrel pumpkin interaction going on for Amy. Thanks for sharing that, Amy. That's awesome. And happy Halloween. It's good to hear from you. All right, so I'm going to pour myself a little more tea here and start moving on to the next part which I think would be drawing an individual seed. So I'm gonna write C down here. Oh, Debbie's here too. Also for people who just joined in, I'm going to um, just present myself really quickly since this is the one day a year I get to wear this costume. Hello, I'm Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> and we're drawing pumpkins today on the Nature Journal show. All right, so um, back to work. All right, so got the sprouted one, that was good. Now, um, let's see, what's next? I wanna draw an individual seed, so I'm gonna zoom in. Um, I could do like an inventory, so it'd be really cool to do like a, a list here, an inventory, and I could take out all of the seeds, count the total number of seeds, and then I could um, measure the sizes or something, or I could also just count how many um, good ones there are versus those infertile ones that are all small and um, squishable, and then how many sprouted ones. So that would be a cool project that you could do with a pumpkin very easily. Um, it would be good to do with kids or something. So I'm taking this seed out right here and I'm going to draw that. I'll hold that up quickly. And then I'll also show you a diagram from a book um, about the seeds of plants in this genus and the different ways that you can tell them apart. Um, if I can find the page. Here we go. Check this out. So these are the four major species of squash, cucurbita. So the top one is what we're looking at now, cucurbita pepo. So all of these are examples. That's a naked one right there. So if you've eaten pepitas or pumpkin seed, they're probably from this variety. Um, and then you can see how much variation there is. 
The next one is cucurbita maxima. So kabocha squash, Hubbard squashes, and any of the ones with a fat stem are usually in this. Um, some pumpkins, what people call pumpkins, are in cucurbita maxima. Then there's uh, cucurbita mixta and cucurbita machata. So those are some of the variations in the seeds, which is really cool. If this photograph is not super quality because it's kind of old, but um, you get somewhat of an idea. There's a lot of variation in the seeds that can be useful for identifying them. And many of them have this sort of weird film um, on this top side. And some of them have different colors and different ridges or that outline is different shapes. Um, so I'll just quickly draw this and I'll draw one to scale approximately. I like to do that and then write actual size. I can blow it up, but there's no point in me blowing this up like a hundred times if I don't really see that much more detail. If I were looking through the microscope or a magnifying glass, maybe that would make sense. Um, even at this size, there's not really that much new that I can draw here. I do want to come back and look at some of the stuff from today under the microscope that I have. Okay, so that's the seed. What was the other thing that we were going to look at? I can't remember. So I'm going to write the titles of the two different species on here. Oh, I should share um, Amy's thing for people who aren't on Facebook to see it. Here's some interesting pumpkin squirrel activity that Amy noticed. At first, I thought you were going to say that the ones that had large features scared away the the squirrels and they were too afraid to go up to the scary looking jack-o'-lanterns and eat them and they only ate the like not scary jack-o'-lanterns. All right, so very cool, Amy. Thanks for, I just had to post that up so people who are watching on YouTube could see that as well. Okay, so I'm going to go back and add some more information. Feel free if you have spaces to just add in whatever text you need to. Um, how to show discontinuity. That's what this diagram was. I think there's a better symbol for it. And then I'm going to write the species name. So this one's cucurbita ficafolia, which means, I think that means fig, fig leafed. So I guess you could say these, the shape of these looks like a fig. Maybe I'll write that actually inside of the, um, oh no, the, the plant is going in my tea. These tendrils getting in the tea. Whoa, look, it grabbed onto the teacup. Get out of there. What? That was weird. Okay, so um, cucurbita uh, ficafolia. I'll just write it down here. Um, hopefully it'll fit. Cucurbita, lowercase species name, ficafolia. And then this one's cucurbita pepo, I'm pretty sure. Let's double check in the book just so I don't give you misinformation. Um, cucurbita pepo. What the cucurbita maxima? Why is it starting with cucurbita maxima? That's actually my favorite. Um, cucurbita machada. Here we go. Cucurbita pepo. Um, acorn, ebony bush, Ford hook, golden, Jersey golden, royal snow white, blah, 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 table queen. Come on, delicata. Right. Yep, delicata down here. See, I underlined it. It's pretty much delicata is pretty much the only cucurbita pepo I really like. <laughs> And it's like one of, it's a mainstream, pretty mainstream squash that you can get like anywhere, but it's actually often like really delicious. There are different varieties of delicata, but um, really good one. So cucurbita pepo, I just want to double check to see that it was cucurbita pepo. Oh, 
almost made that into an uppercase. That would have been bad. Okay, and then the one last thing that we're going to do is I want to introduce you to a little baby snake. Uh, maybe we could do some quick sketches of um, the snake, um, this little gopher snake, before um, wrapping the show up for today. Um, so here it is. Just kidding. No, that is not a real snake. Um, but I do have a real snake right here. Let's see. There you are. So this is my new pet gopher snake. Let go of that leaf. It's okay. Come on. Oh. They like to do these displays. Yeah, it's okay. So gopher snakes are a non-venomous snake, but they do several things to imitate rattlesnakes. So you'll notice the tail movement, and if there's dry leaves around, that'll make a rattling noise. And then they also broaden their head, which you can see there, um, to look more like a venomous snake. Venomous snakes often have a broader head than non-venomous snakes. Let me get the light a little bit better here and listen to the sound just putting them by the microphone I don't know if they're a male or a female yet so I'm just gonna use the gender neutral pronoun and their name is Castaneda look at that little tail wiggle I'm gonna see if I can get a dry leaf here so you can hear the rattling sound Here, listen to this. It's okay. Did you hear that? Isn't that so cool? And what I'm curious about is, do they know when their tail is hitting something that makes a good sound? And if they intentionally move it, because it feel like they started off up here and move the tail to a better sound spot and stayed there once they heard it. Can you hear the sound? Let me know if you can hear the rattling. It's okay. So eventually they'll get more used to they'll probably get more used to me. And not all gopher snakes um, make this much of a, a bluffing sound. But the cool thing is that they haven't, um, they have not musked on me yet. So I'm gonna switch to my other hand so I can draw. Come here. So a lot of, um, a lot of snakes in this family do this thing called musking. Um, that makes uh, you smell bad. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of do a couple like sort of gesture, what I would call gesture sketches for a snake. And I really think drawing snake. it's not just that, it's not just because I, I love snakes personally, but I actually think that practicing drawing snakes is like one of the best things you can do as an artist. So back in the Renaissance, they would draw clothing folds over and over and over again. And folds in clothing, even if you don't want to draw people wearing clothing, um, the drawing folds in clothing, it helps you learn how to draw three dimensional things really well. And I think that snakes, just because they're long cylinders, are a really, really good animal to practice um, drawing with. That'll, that'll improve all of your drawing. Might be fun. How are you going to show movement? If you want to show the the, the tail interaction, um, how would you show that? That's always the that was one of the main things that Leonardo tried to figure out how to do. How to show um, something? How to make something look animate in an inanimate two dimensional drawing? And how and how do you show movement? Uh, movement was really important for him.
Yeah, the um, I'm the the name is Castaneda, so it's sort of like a play on words, but it's actually um, like Carlos Castaneda, the author of the Don Juan um, books, um, but also sort of a play on word with the Spanish word for um, rattle. And casca cascabel is um, rattlesnake in Spanish. So, what are the main patterns that you notice on the back? And sometimes separating those out, you can see how I did the tail here. Um, the tail has a more simple pattern, but sometimes you can just simplify the basic shapes um, on the back, for example. Like I might be just sort of noticing that these are basically squares. I can see Castaneda is looking at my pin right now. And then I'm noticing that there's other shapes that kind of connect between those squares here on the sides. So even just doing, if you see a snake just for a little bit, try capturing something like that. Let me get the light a little bit better here. There we go. I think partly because the paper is um, so white, it makes the light a lot harder. It's okay. Look, it's a friend. Hello, I am a fake snake. What's your name? I don't think they like it. Okay, fake snake needs to go bye-bye. Uh oh, off into the pumpkin patch. Okay, so I think that's probably a good amount of snake drawing practice for the day. Oh no, they're going down into my medieval leggings that I'm wearing. Um, so it, that means it's probably time to get ready to sign out here because um, I'm gonna have to take care of the snake in my leggings. Um, this is Leonardo da Vinci, um, guest host of the Nature Journal show for today, nature journaling some pumpkins and other cucurbita species was super fun. Um, and just so you all know, I will be putting affiliate links for the hair products that I've been using so that I could grow my hair out this long. I've been taking vitamins all month long to get my hair to look this way for Halloween. So um, thanks to all my Patreon supporters. You make it possible for me to buy the vitamins for my hair to grow this way. And if you want to find out more about my Patreon, go to patreon.com slash Marley uh, Give the video a thumbs up and check out some of the other nature journaling videos in my playlist. If you nature journal today and filled some pages, go on and buy yourself a chocolate or an ice cream or give yourself a special treat because if you filled one page of nature journaling or even if you filled half a page of nature journaling today, then you've done a really good job. I'm going to go find this snake and I will see you next time on the nature journal show Wednesday at 6 PM. Bye. Happy Halloween.